Okay, hi. Welcome everyone to this, today's lecture on project results of a project uh, called Sustainable Tourism in the Alps, which kind of framework are needed. Welcome here in the audience and also welcome online. The, the whole lecture, the whole session is streamed online. So I'm very happy to welcome Jakob Siedersmeyer from the International Commission for the Protection of the Alps, CIPA here, who is kind of a uh, co-lecturer in this common session next hour. Okay, so thank you, Christian. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, and let me present uh, Mr. Christian Baumgartner to you. Um, he's the lead of major sustainable tourism here at the University for Applied Science in Tour, and uh, his second role, so to say, today is he's also the vice president of uh, CIPA International and the tourism expert, so that's we will do this uh, lecture together today. Well, you know, both, both partners here, both the university and just to say a big thank you to the university for giving us the chance to do this online streaming, and CIPRA are quite involved for several years into this issue of sustainable tourism. Uh, CIPRA is existing for more than 60 years, and sustainable tourism was one of the most important topics all over the time. We are doing a lot of projects, concrete implementation projects, small regions, model projects, but doing also political work and communication. One of the most important questions always upcoming is, well, what's needed? Who is actually in this complex situation? Who are the stakeholders that really deal with the implementation? Who approach? You know, sustainability is very complex. Tourism is very complex. And this combination of sustainable tourism is even more complex. So we have stakeholders on all different political levels, local, international, international. We have businesses, uh, private sector, NGOs. So the question always was, who actually is the driving force when it comes to sustainable tourism? And this is what we're going to try to answer here, and also looking for the differences in the different uh, alpine countries and different destinations in the, in the Alps. Okay, so what we did uh, within this project was um, at the first step, uh, we had a look at the different alpine countries and uh, tried to summarize how does tourism look like in these countries. So the first step was that we made some kind of a system images of the different Alpine countries, so who were the most, uh, most important ministries, who were the most important stakeholders, and so on. And then in the second step, uh, we invited tourism experts from all these Alpine countries to discuss on the system images together with us. So they gave feedback. We asked them the question, is there anything miss missing? What has to be added? Is there something wrong? And what does this mean uh, in regards to sustainable tourism? And with the system images, um, then we came together or we collected all the inputs we gathered from the experts from all the African countries today and brought it to, so to say, a system overview which uh, is uh, or which can be applied to all of the Alpine, to all of the Alpine countries. What we further discussed uh, with the tourism experts is um, what is really needed, as Christian already said, in order to make the tourism system more sustainable. And as the term or the topic, the sustainable tourism is a uh, yeah, quite big one or a, or a quite difficult one, we asked three particular questions to the tourism experts. The first deal about the winter tourism, so what is needed to change the actual status. The second was about the regional products, so what is needed to bring more local and regional products to the tourism industry. And um, the third one is about uh, sustainable mobility in tourism. Well, I you know, started with this lecture, immediately making the first mistake. I'll this year thank you to the university, but I forgot to thank the uh, German Minister for the Environment, EUBMUB, who actually was financing and sponsoring CIPA for this project. So very much thank you, and I'm quite sure that you are online. Thank you very much to uh, Berlin for the financial support in here. I mean, if you look into the, to the structure of, of tourism, uh, going to the top level, which is the international level, the European Union, and here we have a quite interesting situation that changed a little bit in 2007 with the new Lisbon Treaty, which you see online here now. The Lisbon Treaty, for the first time, provided at least some competences in, in tourism to, to the EU. Before, it was only the member states having competences, and some of the member states, especially those that are heavily involved in tourism, always tried to avoid that the union has too many competences. But with the regulations in the Lisbon Treaty, 2007, as I said, at least some of the ideas, some of the competences moved from the member states to, uh, to the Commission, to the European bodies. But if you look into the details, and you see the three main points here. No? <laughs> Could you go back? European Union? If you, you see the main points here. Uh, tourism is recognized as one of the important drivers. 
but still the commission only has the uh, possibility to uh, do more. Awareness raising for the importance of tourism, the commission has not the option to do really harmonization of tourism uh, politics. So it's kind of framework that could be shaped by the commission, um, which also results then at the end in some well, framework uh, projects like developing some sustainable tourism indicators that are applied now in different destinations in Europe, discussing quality indicators and quality criteria that never took, uh, that never were implemented at the end. Uh, this then also the reason why several member states now to trying to put pressure via other European policies on the tourism sector, meaning, for example, going via the agricultural regional development sector, where there's a huge money available in the tourism sector. The Commission has only very limited funds possible. So th there is not really a European tourism policy at the moment in place. It's just that while the Lisbon Treaty, at least there is a recognition uh, of tourism as an important driving sector, which already is a kind of um, step forward in the, in the right direction now, understanding. Um, what we have been now between the European and the federal level is on the one hand side uh, the Alpine Convention. The Alpine Convention is an international agreement between the, all the Alpine countries, you know, from Monaco till uh, Slovenia. And here, most important to name is uh, at first the Tourism Protocol of the Alpine uh, Convention, and second, the Working Group on uh, Sustainable Tourism that uh, also deals uh, with the issues we are presenting here. And uh, DIPA is also a member uh, of this working group and brings in uh, our, uh, their experience. On the other hand side, we have, and this is pretty new, we have the USELP, so the European Strategy and the ELPS. And uh, the micro-regional strategies in general, they are instruments for st structural policy of the European Union that deal uh, with challenges, challenges of specific regions like the Alpine space. So we have all the common things together here with all the mountains and valleys and so on. And this is the, the approach of the micro-regional strategy. When we then come uh, to the federal level, here we see that in all, most all of the Alpine countries, the Ministry for Economic Affairs, they play a quite important and a quite vital role when it comes to tourism because they are the main responsible. When you see here at the slide, we have, for example, the Ministry of Economics uh, in France. Uh, we have the German Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. So this is the difference. All have to do on one and side with economy, but they also have certain competences which may be energy, which may be technology, or which even uh, may be sports or whatever. Um, we have a bit of a different role now in the countries of uh, Austria, France, and Italy. In Austria, there is now since, what is it, about uh, one or two months, uh, there is the Ministry for Sustainability and Tourism, and this ministry is now in charge uh, of all the tourism-related uh, things. In France, it's very special that here is the Foreign uh, Affairs and International Development Ministry is responsible for all, the, for all the tourism affairs. And we will come to that later on here, the marketing organization of the whole country of France, of Coup France, they are attached to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is quite interesting compared to the other countries. And in Italy, we have also the Ministry of uh, Cultural Heritage Activities in Tourism, and they do the development of strategies and speak out recommendations. And here they partly work together with the Ministry of Economics. Good point. There's really quite a lot of differences in the different countries. And I mean, now talking as an Austrian, uh, I like the situation that we have this ministry comb combination of sustainability and tourism on the one, on the one hand, but actually we don't have any experience by now. I mean, so far always the, the competences were divided into the Ministry for Economy sustainability was more in the environmental field. So we're really looking forward if this will change the tourism politics, uh, having the first time in Europe this chance that sustainability is directly together with, with tourism. So there's a new step forward again also here. We see also development in other uh, countries. Germany, for example, the ministry installed very recently, so they just now are beginning to, to work, a federal sense of competence for tourism directly under the ministry. In the last years, the German ministry that was responsible, still is responsible for tourism, Ministry for Economy, has very limited number of staff members. There was not really an intensive German tourism policy available. And this is one of the reasons why now this installment of this competence center might bring some new drive into it. So they're responsible for conducting some researches or bring some calls that others do the research, also a little bit providing some information and data then to, to the National Tourism Organization, which is responsible for the marketing. So we see some differences in many of the countries go a step beyond uh, 
better informed truth and politics with more clear targets as a truth and politics uh, in the country. So looking forward to that. Okay, when we now come to the other ministries, uh, then maybe as you know, in tourism, it's like in, uh, unlike in any, any other um, industrial sector, is that it's quite an interdisciplinary area. And as you can see here in the overview chart, the different ministries, they also affected by tourism. May it be the ministries for transport and traffic to deal with the tourism mobility, may it be education and science to develop all the curricula, may it be labor and social affairs, which is quite uh, important, but also, of course, the ministries for the environment to do uh, all the nature protection things, dealing with soil, nature parks, and so on. Food and agriculture is very important. We will come to that later on when we discuss about the, de the detailed questions on what's their role. And it's also about the interior minister that play a role. But furthermore, we have also some other ministries that are still responsible for tourism. These are, for instance, uh, the ministries for health. Uh, they have to deal with the health tourism, sports when it comes to all these big events that are organized and partly defense, justice, and foreign affairs. And foreign affairs, as I already said before, has a very special role in France. Well, it's all about money. Money makes the world go round, as we all know. So looking to finance is quite an important aspect. And uh, as I already said, there is some money available to the European Union, but not directly for tourism. So, but the uh, ERDF funds are why this the topic of regional development are very often also used for tourism-related projects in the destination. But when it comes to the Alpine countries, a lot of money obviously goes into, into marketing. So uh, marketing organizations on national, on regional level, receive relevant funding from, from the state side. And additionally, some banks do play quite an important role in giving, on the one hand, loans for investment uh, under special conditions, especially for touristic investment. So money again comes from, from the state. For example, in, in Austria, we have the Ministry of Tourism Sustainability that finances the Austrian Bank of Hotel and Tourism that then at the end gives loans or also pays some, some uh, money to projects. Looking to, to, Swiss, here, to Switzerland, here the situation is a bit different as there is more money available from the state directly to uh, projects and investments. We have the Swiss new regional policy, uh, NRP, who is a really key driver for touristic development. They have approximately 40 million Swiss francs annually for tourism projects and another 50 million Swiss francs for tourism-related investment. However, especially looking to Switzerland, there is also a new tourism policy in place, uh, which passed the, the, the Swiss government end of last year. And one key actor here and one key element of this uh, tourism strategy is also uh, not only financing, but also monitoring, which is quite important when it comes to strategic development. And so the development of tourism in terms of sustainable development uh, in the last, from the last period is a, a key and major task for the, for the ongoing strategy in, in Switzerland. Okay, thank you, Christian. Then the next quite very important stakeholder group uh, are the interest groups, and they have a different influence in the different Alpine countries, which is from very high to tremendous high. And for example, here the uh, interest groups, they can be economic associations. We have quite a lot of them dealing with tourism in the Alpine space, but also hotel and restaurant associations, travel agencies, trade, uh, trade associations, and also labor unions uh, that uh, look about the working conditions of the respective employees in the field of tourism. But it's not only business driven. I mean, we do also have other important stakeholders <coughs> like research and education. And we are here at the university. You know, obviously, different universities, universities of applied science, research institutions are and could be even more an important driver, especially when it comes to sustainable development. Um, and this, this type of stakeholders, uh, at the moment here in pink, uh, we also have to consider the, the national statistical offices, for example, the Austrian, Austrian uh, Statistic Office uh, or the Italian ISTAT, they provide important statistical data. Sometimes they do own research or they hire other institutions for research. Then coming to, to the next area, marketing. Yeah, we go into the National Tourism Organization. Um, marketing plays a key role, obviously, in tourism. And again, here there are some differences in the country situation. 
all the national, all the Alpine countries have national tourism organizations that play a key role in, in the marketing. And also, there is like Verbo in Germany, the Deutsche Zentrale für Tourismus, they said they tried tourism in, in Switzerland and others. But when you look to the responsibilities, you definitely find some, some differences. For example, in Germany, the DZT is only responsible for the international marketing, for the marketing of tourism to Germany coming from other countries. In Austria, the situation is quite diverse. So the, the Austrian tourism board is both responsible for international marketing, but also financed by the Bundesländer. There's also part of the Austrian marketing that goes towards the Austrian tourists. In Slovenia, for example, as Slovenia politically has only the national level and the municipality, but nothing in between, the Slovenian Tourism Board uh, is responsible for everything. So quite diverse situation in the, in the different countries. And the last but not least important stakeholder group is NGOs, representing the, the CIPRA Alpine Commission here. This is one of the important uh, drivers and key players also, but obviously also others. You need to name here the Alpine Association, the, uh, the Alpine Clubs, uh, Nature Friends, or the, the CIPRA, or some associations for sustainable mobility doing specifically also tourism mobility issues. But additionally, you could also name something like the Network of Protected Areas in the Alpine regions, Alpac. So NGOs work on different topic-related levels but very often, if it comes to tourism, they're a very important part, especially when it comes to project implementation. Okay, so then if we go on from <clears throat> top down, then we are now finished, so to say, with the national level, and we come then to the federal level, like the federal state. So in every Alpine country, we have some different structure on the federal level that also deal uh, with tourism. For example, in Germany and Austria, there's so-called Bundesländer, here in Switzerland, cantons, in Italy, the Regione. And in France, uh, these are the département, which then have their own competencies uh, when it comes to tourism. When we now have a look at the financing structures uh, of the federal level, then it gets even more complicated because not just the different countries, even the different, different federal states have different funding policies regarding tourism. So, and for example, if we, if we start here with the South Tyrol, there they have uh, funding for the commercial businesses in tourism. In the Regione Piemonte, for example, they have particular funding for the product development of sustainable tourism products. And for example, in Friuli, they have the Giulia, or in the Alaska Valley, we then have also different funding programs. In France, uh, we have in the Department of Savoy, there is uh, a funding for the family run hotels, or in the Department of Alpes Provence, we have the funding for creational offers in nature, but they also support very strong cycling tourism. So here you can see that the topics are quite different in all the federal states, depending on their main interests or on the main tourism products they want to develop and to push forward. And finally, in Germany, in Germany is uh, mostly um, Bavaria, is yeah, the most important federal state when it comes to Alpine tourism. And then we have a small part which is in the area of Baden-Württemberg. But in Bavaria, we have also a lot of uh, commercial funding, uh, which is uh, executed by the Bavarian Ministry for the economic affairs. Then it's the same on the federal level. We also have the tourism marketing organizations in the different countries. For example, in Austria, you have the, C the C seven so-called London Tourism Organizations that deal with Alpine tourism. In Switzerland, you have the Cantonal Tourism Organization. In Germany, you have Bayern Tourism, Bad Württemberg Tourism, and so on. And in France, you have Auvergne Rhône Alpes, and so on. The mandate for regional destination marketing uh, is to promote on the one hand side the region, so here it's the same like it's uh, for the whole country, but on the other hand side, they are also driver for develop new topics to create new products and also to do some services um, for their stakeholders on the next level, which is meaning all the uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial actors um, and so on. You hear we jump a little bit in the wording between region and destination. And I like this destination approach usually when I teach because I think on a, on a destination level, you can really deal with most of the tourism relevant challenges and many solutions could be found on, on this level. But actually there is not one definition of, of destination. There are several definitions of destination. For example, the, the famous marketing expert, Kotla, always defines destination just as bound, just as their political or just strategic boundaries. There's a longer definition of destination here coming by UNWTO that I usually like most because this definition goes also into 
the existence of various stakeholders in the destination, and especially looking to the hosting community. To my understanding of a destination, it's important to look at the different experts, different local stakeholders, and especially the people living there. Definitions of de destinations are different in different countries. Also, the size is different. You have destinations of having just some villages. You have whole cantons or Bundesländer at one destination. This is obviously also related always to the, to the distance to, to the market that's approached. So you can find just some examples for destinations in the different uh, countries. Destinations sometimes are combined with protected areas, like the Bayer Reserve Gottes Weisertal in Vorarlberg could be uh, a whole canton, like the destination in Britain. But here, Britain contains several sub destinations. So the destination approach is quite different and different from country to country. Also, the function, the precise structure of the destination is, is different. In some countries, we have more businesses being a member in the destination. Uh, management organizations. Uh, in some countries, it's more the municipalities being there, and also the tasks from product development to training to marketing is different from country to country. Last stakeholder here on the local level, protected areas. Um, according to the definitions, we have different types of protected areas from nature parks, biosphere reserves, national parks. Uh, and the already mentioned umbrella organization of the Alpine Protected Areas Alpine. And all those protected areas have to deal with tourism because naturally uh, those protected areas are very interested, interesting target areas for tourists to come. So they have to deal with huge pressure of, of tourists. This makes them also uh, to kind of important stakeholders in cooperation with tourism associations, in cooperation uh, with NGOs to deal with this issue, especially when it comes to sustainability in tourism. Okay, and then going further top down, we come to the municipalities, and the municipalities in the Alpine region, they always have, also have quite high competences when it comes to tourism. These are, for example, they can do the regulations in terms of the land use, the commercial policy, they can set the framework for the buildings, how they should look like, and they are furthermore, um, they have the ability to make a kind of guiding principles for tourism for their own municipality. In France, for example, we heard when we did um, these uh, expert online workshops in France, and they say that the municipalities in France are extremely active when it comes to tourism and sustainable tourism, because there they said it's a bit of a lack of funding uh, from the next level, and so the municipalities in France uh, started to do their own thing and to bring things forward like tourism development, tourism product development, and so on. And finally, we come to the private entrepreneurs. Uh, and this, here it is much more the same in all of the open space that we have a very, very high number of individual uh, entrepreneurs from the hoteliers, from the one who offers leisure activities, from the nature guides, from the restaurants, from the one who offers mobility services that have an own interest because they make a living out of tourism and they bring things forward on their own. You have quite in every municipality or in, in uh, every destination, you have a tremendous high number of individual stakeholders dealing with tourism. So and that's why it even makes it more complicated when you say we want to develop a sustainable tourism where everyone uh, joins the same vision and works in the same direction. You see, the, you see the complexity of all the different stakeholders, different types of stakeholders, different levels they work on. Um, this makes it not so easy to deal with sustainability. And this is why we've chosen three exemplary uh, challenges that we'd like to go into now, starting with winter tourism. We change the, the place here for the moment. And you know the situation in winter tourism is that many Alpine areas, many Alpine destinations focus on this clash, classical uh, skiing tourism. This was the big hope starting from the early 50s, last century, and it was a driving force. And everyone who had a mountain he tried to develop skiing tourism. But on the other hand, you know that climate change is already to be faced now and, and here, and especially skiing areas in low altitudes already facing challenges and problems now. Some of these key destinations, especially in, in southern Germany, in Bavaria, but in Württemberg, changed already. They dismantled their facilities and changed from classical ski tourism to different winter 
uh, activities, snow related and non snow related. So there is a huge pressure on the on the destination. But what we see is looking to, to the different policies they do is most of the cases they follow the business as usual. So they went in artificial snowing, which needs uh, low temperatures, which is not always possible, which is costly in terms of sustainable development. It's also, it's also even more energy, which then again contributes to, to climate change. They're investing in huge infrastructure to um, improve a little bit the summer season. So the, the modes that are found now at the moment to, to tackle climate change and winter tourism are very often not sustainable in its own. And we have different stakeholders that need to be approached and that are involved now. Of course, it's the, the different ministries that are responsible, but it's very much the, the local or the, the regional level, so the local destination management organizations, the local destinations that are afraid, that, that feel the pressure, and they need to react. So those, they, together with the financing structures, which is again in the ministry, trying to deal with this new situation. Academics and NGOs are also involved, but at the moment a little bit outside and having more this, this warning uh, scenario saying we, you need to deal, but actually the willingness that at the moment is to be seen in the destination is quite limited. It's business as usual, and the next five to ten years is simply too near. We don't say that there is no destination anymore, so skiing tourism will exist even in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years but it will most probably be concentrated on larger destinations, higher altitudes, and especially the, the smaller destinations, the low-lying destinations need to find those new business models. So what we see here is that it needs both a top-down and a bottom-up policy to, to deal with this. You need new solutions on the destination level. You need new frameworks, new financing models coming from, from the national and the international level. And what's quite interesting is here, what we heard in, in several of the countries, here actually the NGOs and the academics could play quite a vital role. If there is no vision to be found from the tourism ministry, no vision to be found from the destination, it could be uh, a cooperation between different universities together with NGOs uh, that support here the, the ministries and the destination in the creation of a new uh, vision for winter tourism in, in the Asian region. But that's definitely a big big challenge. Coming to the second important issue. So the second important issue we discussed uh, with uh, the tourism experts was uh, raising the question, uh, regional products, the food and drink, how can the use of local and regional products in tourism and gastronomy be strongly promoted? And when we look back uh, at the history here around the open space, then we have the case that most of the inhabitants of the Alps, they have been farmers in the old days. And then when tourists uh, got aware in the Alps and all this beauty and they see, okay, you can, you can do uh, great recre recreational activities, the inhabitants of the Alps uh, never quickly realized, oh, I can make an extra money when I let people sleep into, uh, in my farm and then serve them the local product. So to say, or the thesis is a bit to say, these days, the regional economic cycle, when it comes uh, to regional food products, uh, has been a quite sustainable one. But somehow, um, this got lost. The farmers became uh, hoteliers, and consumer needs changed, and regional products got lost. Thankfully, in the last uh, few years, we see a renaissance uh, of the regional products. They become, so to say, chic again, and it's good for the hoteliers to serve their guests uh, the product from the region. On a transnational level from the European Union, um, with its agricultural aid program, uh, we see that more, at it mostly the, the large scale agricultural enterprises are funded and not the small ones, uh, which is quite a big problem. And what we see here now is the system images, image, which was what was quite interesting for us and what was also quite interesting in discussing this uh, with the tourism experts, that all these stakeholders that are now here in orange they are not are just partly related to tourism. So this means when it comes to regional products in terms of food and drink, then they have nothing, nothing to do with tourism. And this was also the feedback that we got. A local producer who makes, yeah, you know, let's say, excellent cheese. When he wants to make the cheese, he has an interest in maybe selling the cheese to the local people. He has an interest in producing a tremendous high, highly quali high quality product but at first he has no interest in selling these to the gastronomy or to the tourists. But we have seen when they have a high quality product developed, 
then most of the stakeholders of the tourism come to this uh, to this uh, producer, and then they try to somehow make business or if they can we tell the story of this product, can we bring it uh, to our tourists, can we visit the cheesery, um, and so on. We have quite different um, circumstances here in the different countries. So when we see the house situation in the Alpine countries, um, what is quite surprisingly is that we get the feedback that in Italy, I guess as we all know, Italy has a tremendous high number of high quality products. But the feedback from the expert was that sometimes the people are not aware on, on the high quality of the product. So this is to sell it uh, for a lower price than they could. In France, in France, it's a problem of, with the lack of communication. The products are there, but there are no good distribution channels, uh, channels and there is no um, there is no communication strategy for regional products pushing the things forward. And in Slovenia, and in uh, Slovenia, we see the problem that it's still uh, not known by the tourists on how many high quality products have, from wine to olive oil to even uh, fish from the coastal line. And so they have different, uh, they have different marketing uh, campaigns going on in order to make people aware that Slovenia has very high quality products. What we definitely see in all of the Alpine countries is that there are different initiatives running. They run not just because for tourists, they also run for locals. So for example, in Austria, there is this label of the Genusweg in Österreich, uh, which is funded by the government and um, yeah, the, the, the body behind this label is the Akramas Austria Marketing Association that brings things forward and also partly the corporations with tourism. Then in Switzerland, uh, here we have some quite uh, regional initiatives, and I guess you know this 100% uh, uh, Valbostiavo, 100% Valbostiavo, which is built by Tukur, which is a quite famous initiative, or became a quite famous initiative because it's that great. Uh, then in Slovenia, as I said, we have the brand development of Taste of Slovenia, where they want to bring the product forward. And uh, finally, we have also an initiative by the Alpine Club, or by the German Alpine Club from Austria, uh, Germany, and South Tyrol, which is called uh, die Berge, so how the mountains taste like, where they say uh, serve particular regional food uh, in their mountains. So finally, uh, what is needed in order to bring the regional product forward? So the first thing uh, we found out a management body would be quite good, bringing together the different actors within the we are within the value chain of the regional product. So these are uh, first the producers, the distribution, it's the tourism, and it's the marketing. So someone who brings together all the different interests and develops a sustainable, um, a sustainable commercial chain for this uh, product. Then the second is that transnational and national uh, financing grants for marketing are needed, but also for the local producers to support them. And the third one is to foster associated change and uh, make tourists and locals aware on their importance and on their importance of the high quality products. So how good it is to eat the cheese where you've just uh, visited the cheesery or bacon or whatever. And what I think is a quite important point too, is that we see that if we have high quality local products uh, people can identify with, they can make a living out of it, and it has also to do with uh, the identity which is created by this product for the Alpine inhabitants. So there's quite a different situation here in, in uh, using local products to skiing areas so with the food uh, transition. And with the food, we said it's both top, uh, top down and bottom up. Here in the field of uh, agricultural and local products, it's very much uh, bottom up. Plus, the need for uh, non-tourism extras like the agriculture structure. In the third example, and the third most also very important topic, mobility in the Alpine tourism, you will see that we have a third situation. Here it's very much um, multilateral or multi-sectoral different ministries being involved and very much at the end uh, bottom up that, that's needed. The situation of mobility in the Alps is that a large percentage of the Alpine tourists are coming self-organized. So there is not, package tourism is not really relevant in the Alps. That means also the choice of the mobility behavior is done individually. That means you need to influence individual travelers uh, to change their uh, mobility behavior to come up with a more sustainable, more climate-friendly mobility at the end, which makes the things not, not easier. So of course, important driving factors here 
uh, the, the respective ministries, so both the Ministry for Transport and the Ministry for Tourism. In several other countries, they already said it's quite good cooperation. We'll come back to that in a, in a while. But as it's about behavior, it's very much about the marketing. The very important aspect here is the, the marketing of tourism on the local level, individual, in the, in the businesses, but obviously also in the destination on the, on the, on the national level. Looking to the different Alpine other countries, we have very different situations. For example, Switzerland being one of the countries worldwide having the best public transport, uh, it would be very easy to reach nearly all the different destinations by public transport. But still here, there is a large percentage of especially foreign tourists coming by uh, plane and rental car or by, by uh, public, not by public transport. So what's needed in Switzerland would be a, a stronger communication strategy for the existing uh, high quality public transport. Austria invested, as another example, quite a lot of money. There was a good, long lasting national support program uh, dealing with uh, climate protection general and one sub program focused on tourism related mobility that enabled several destinations, several event managers, several businesses, private businesses to implement measures that motivate tourists to change from car to public transport. One of the really good examples where national funding strategy could really steer the, the tourism development to at least a little bit more sustainability. What we heard from, from other countries, especially from Slovenia and France, is that there are not so many uh, activities, activities existing in this uh, trend towards more sustainable mobility. This might be also related both to the political situation uh, and especially to the situation of public transport in those countries, as the transport there is not so good, by far not so good, like in Switzerland or in several parts of Austria. So what would be needed here in, in uh, this sustainable mobility? At the end, it's again about money. So what we would need is financial support. Financial support, like this example from Austria shows, to implement concrete measures but also to give some small incentives to the tourists or to, to do more and better and more targeted communication towards the tourists, to motivate them to change and to give them all the information about luggage transport, et cetera, all the arguments that usually make the, uh, the choice for the car more relevant could be counter-argued in, in, in a good communication. But what's obviously also needed is improvement of the travel chains of the different modes of transport, Need, you need better information, better luggage transport, higher quality, uh, better timetables, readable in different languages. So there's a long list of activities the transport providers and at the end also the ministries for transport need to do. And at the end, it's all about also marketing. So marketing, improved marketing and communication in this field is required. But this is a very, this is really an area where it needs to be top down from the ministry towards the destination and then from the marketing side, uh, again, bottom up. Okay, so these have been the first results. Um, uh, thanks already now for watching. What we will do now with all these system images and the results of the different workshops is that we take them uh, to Slovenia because on the 25th and 26th of May, uh, there is a deeper annual conference held in place in Slovenia with the title How to Rethink Tourism as a Holistic Offer Based on Local Resources. And we will further discuss the question how to make tourism more sustainable. As you, could, as you saw in these pictures and on the presentation right now, it is quite complicated, but it's also quite interesting, and that makes it quite funny to work on such a complicated issue. Mm -hmm. Definitely not the end of the story. I mean, the results, we learn a lot about the different situations in different countries. We learn a lot about stakeholder mat matrices. Uh, we're going to use this and try to develop in the other field, one or the other field, uh, very concrete projects. Now, using this knowledge really to, to doing a step forward to, towards sustainable tourism. So, thank you very much for being here, for watching, to listen to us. Thank you very much for being online. And again, thank you very much to, on the one hand, the financing partner, the German BMO Bay. Uh, and the University of Applied Science here in Kru for all the technical support for the facilities here. And last but not least, also to uh, Magdalena Medicinal, to who did a huge effort in uh, providing the techniques and uh, providing the, the appraisals. Thank you very much, Jakob. Thank you. you as well, of course. Thank you, Christian.
Thank you.